What if I told you that just 14 wolves reshaped an entire ecosystem? In 1995, the US government made what seemed like a simple decision. They took 14 Canadian wolves and reintroduced them into Yellowstone National Park. But what followed wasn't just the return of a species, it was a complete transformation. The revival of a dying landscape, an ecological chain reaction that would ultimately save America $94 billion. But how could 14 wolves accomplish all this? To understand that, we need to go back to when everything started falling apart. Quick reminder, if you're ready for an incredible story about nature's ability to heal itself in the most unexpected ways, hit that like button. Let's rewind to the early 1900s. Back then, wolves were seen as nothing more than dangerous pests, predators that needed to be eradicated. The US government even had official wolf hunters whose sole job was to trap, shoot, or poison every last wolf. And they did their job well, too well. By 1926, the last Yellowstone wolf pack was gone. People cheered, thinking they had solved a problem. They had no idea they had just created a much bigger one. At first, nothing seemed wrong. No wolves? No problem, right? Wrong. The effects of their disappearance were slow, almost unnoticeable at first. But over the decades, Yellowstone's ecosystem began unraveling. Without wolves, the elk population exploded. By the 1990s, nearly 19,000 elk roamed the park's northern range, turning the landscape into a barren wasteland. Aspen, willows, cottonwoods devoured. Young trees never stood a chance. Springtime saplings gone by winter. But wait, you might ask, couldn't humans just hunt the elk? They tried. But wolves don't just reduce elk numbers, they change their behavior. Scientists call this the ecology of fear, and it turned out to be more important than anyone had realized. When wolves are absent, elk become fearless. They linger in one spot, stripping the land bare, like unsupervised teenagers raiding a fridge. But with wolves around, elk have to stay on the move, remain alert, and avoid certain areas, especially near rivers and streams. This single change reshaped the entire park. By the early 1990s, Yellowstone was in serious trouble. The ecosystem was collapsing. Yet most visitors had no idea. They saw the mountains, the geysers, the roaming elk, and thought everything was fine. But the scientists watching Yellowstone knew the truth, and they were about to witness one of the most astonishing ecological comebacks in history. The decision to bring back wolves wasn't an easy one. Ranchers fiercely opposed it, fearing for their livestock. Hunters worried that wolves would wipe out the elk population they depended on. Some locals even spread wild rumors that the government was planning to release super wolves, specially bred killing machines that would terrorize the entire region. But here's what most people don't know. The wolves chosen for reintroduction weren't just any wolves. They were carefully selected from Canada, where they were already adapted to hunting the same prey found in Yellowstone. Biologists chose wolves from different packs to ensure genetic diversity. They even made sure to pick wolves with no history of conflict with humans or livestock. The actual reintroduction felt like something straight out of a movie. In January 1995, 14 wolves were flown in, each one sedated and transported in individual crates. They were placed in acclimation pens for several weeks, giving them time to adjust to their new home while staying protected. When they were finally released, no one knew what would happen. Would they stay? Would they survive? Would they simply run away? Not only did they stay, they thrived. And this is where things get really interesting. Each wolf pack developed its own personality, hunting style, and even its own family drama, almost like a wild animal soap opera. Take the Druid Peak Pack, for example, the most famous wolf pack in Yellowstone's history. Their leader, a wolf known as 21M, nicknamed The Gentleman, became legendary. He was massive and powerful, yet he never killed defeated rivals. He adopted orphaned pups and remained loyal to a single mate for life. When she passed away, he stopped eating and soon died as well. Even scientists, who typically avoid assigning human emotions to animals, had to admit that something remarkable was happening. But the wolves weren't just creating fascinating stories, 
they were transforming the entire ecosystem. This phenomenon is known as a trophic cascade, but really, it was like a series of ecological dominoes falling in ways no one had predicted. First, the elk population started to decline, not just because wolves were hunting them, but because the elk changed their behavior. They avoided valleys and gorges where they could be easily ambushed. They stopped lingering near rivers, giving young trees a chance to grow. Within just a few years, aspen, willow and cottonwood trees were sprouting along riverbanks once again. But this wasn't just about trees, it was the start of something much bigger. Those trees stabilized the riverbanks, preventing erosion. This, in turn, changed the rivers themselves. They became less meandering, more stable and clearer. And with healthier rivers came another unexpected comeback, beavers. In 1995, there was only one beaver colony in the park. By 2012, there were nine. Today, there are so many that scientists have trouble keeping count. Beavers, as it turns out, are nature's engineers. Their dams created new wetland habitats, attracting frogs, fish, birds, insects, and even otters. The dams also slowed erosion, filtered the water, and helped the park retain moisture during droughts. And then, something even more surprising happened. The wolves started affecting the bears. When wolves make a kill, they don't eat everything. What they leave behind, what scientists call wolf kills, becomes a crucial food source for countless other animals, including grizzly bears. But here's where it gets even more interesting. Remember those berry bushes that elk had been devouring? With fewer elk around, the vegetation started recovering. More berry bushes meant more food for bears, especially in late summer when they're trying to bulk up for hibernation. Scientists discovered that Yellowstone's grizzlies now get a significant portion of their diet from berries, berries that wouldn't exist without wolves. And if that wasn't mind-blowing enough, in 2017, scientists discovered that wolves might even be influencing Yellowstone's supervolcano. Yeah, you heard that right. Before wolves returned, the overgrazing elk were compacting the soil so much that it affected how underground heat dispersed. But when wolves changed elk behavior and vegetation grew back, the soil became less compacted, allowing heat to distribute more evenly underground. Now, this doesn't mean wolves are preventing a volcanic eruption, but it does show just how deep their impact goes, literally. Even scientists studying the park's geothermal activity never expected a predator's return to influence something as fundamental as heat flow beneath the ground. And the wolves didn't just reshape the land, they also changed the balance of power among Yellowstone's predators. Coyotes, for example, were the top dogs before wolves came back. With no real competition, their numbers had soared. But wolves don't tolerate coyotes in their territory. As soon as the wolf packs established themselves, they started killing or driving out coyotes, cutting their population by 50%. At first, this seemed like bad news for the coyotes, but it set off yet another unexpected ecological ripple effect. With fewer coyotes, small mammal populations exploded. More mice and voles meant more food for hawks, owls, foxes and weasels. The entire food web became more complex and more stable, another example of how everything in nature is connected in ways we're only beginning to understand. Now, let's talk about that 94 billion, because this is where the story gets even wilder. When scientists started calculating the economic impact of Yellowstone's recovery, they had to consider things no one had thought about before. First, there's tourism. Wolf watching alone brings in around $35 million per year to the communities surrounding Yellowstone. People from all over the world travel just for a chance to glimpse these iconic predators. Some even spend thousands of dollars on special equipment to observe them from a distance. But that's just the beginning. The recovering forests now capture and store carbon dioxide, a service worth billions in climate change mitigation. Healthier rivers and streams reduce water treatment costs for nearby communities. The restored wetlands help prevent flooding and provide natural water storage. And here's something no one expected. The wolves are even saving money on road maintenance. How? With fewer elk hanging around riverbanks, there's less erosion. Less erosion means more stable ground, which leads to roads and bridges lasting longer and needing fewer repairs. But of course, not everything has been perfect. The wolf reintroduction program hasn't been without its challenges. 
In 2012, an event sparked international outrage. Wolf 832F, known to researchers and tourists as 06 for the year she was born, was legally shot just outside Yellowstone's boundaries. But this wasn't just any wolf. She was considered the most famous wolf in the world. She could take down an elk by herself, led her pack with incredible skill, and had been featured in countless documentaries. In fact, she was so important to science that, at the time of her death, she was wearing three GPS collars because multiple research projects were tracking her movements. Her death underscored one of the biggest challenges in wolf conservation. What happens when wolves leave the park? Inside Yellowstone, they're protected, step beyond the boundaries, and it's a different story. Some states have even introduced wolf hunting seasons, fueling intense debates between conservationists and local communities. But out of all this controversy came something fascinating. Scientists began studying how wolf packs adapt after losing their leaders, and what they found was remarkable. Wolf packs don't simply collapse when an alpha dies. Instead, they reorganize, adapt, and keep going. It's as if they have a built-in backup system, ensuring the pack's survival no matter what. And speaking of discoveries, the Yellowstone Wolf Project has uncovered behaviors no one had ever documented before. For example, wolves don't just function as a group, they have favorites within their packs. Much like humans, they form close bonds with certain members, almost like best friends. They even grieve when a packmate dies, something heartbreakingly captured on video when the famous Wolf 21 lost his mate. The success of Yellowstone's wolves has inspired similar efforts worldwide. In Europe, wolves are naturally returning to areas where they were wiped out centuries ago. In Scotland, there's serious discussion about reintroducing them to help control the overpopulation of deer. Even in China, officials are looking at the Yellowstone model as a way to restore their own ecosystems. But perhaps the biggest lesson from all of this isn't just about wolves, it's about nature itself. Those 14 Canadian wolves didn't just change Yellowstone, they changed how we think about conservation. They proved that sometimes, the best way to fix an ecosystem isn't by micromanaging every detail, it's by bringing back the missing pieces and letting nature take the lead. Today, the Greater Yellowstone Ecosystem is home to around 528 wolves. Every year, they attract over half a million visitors, boosting local economies. They've helped restore rivers, bring back forests, create jobs, and even save billions of dollars in ecological benefits. Not bad for 14 wolves that nobody wanted back in 1995. And here's the real irony. Some of the ranchers who fought hardest against wolf reintroduction now admit it's helped their land. A healthier ecosystem means better grazing for their cattle. Some have even turned their properties into profitable wolf-watching businesses, proving that enemies can become allies in unexpected ways. Scientists are still uncovering new ripple effects of the wolves' return. Just recently, they discovered that wolves may be helping to control disease in wildlife by removing sick animals from the population. In a way, they've become nature's own quality control system. So, if you made it to the end of this incredible story about how 14 wolves transformed an entire ecosystem and saved billions of dollars, take a moment to appreciate the power of nature's balance. And next time someone tells you that one small change can't make a difference, tell them about the wolves of Yellowstone. That's all for today. See you next time.